Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. If everyone could have a seat. We are going to start our final session of the two days. Uh, I'm Michael Kugelman. I'm the Senior Associate for South Asia, Deputy Director of the Asia Program here at the Wilson Center. Um, I feel like a bit of a Debbie Downer, uh, or Michael Downer, uh, that we had that very uplifting, great session on the diaspora just before, and now we're returning to a bit of a more weighty, troubling issue, uh, that, that of extremism. But I think in some ways, you know, it's, it's important, uh, perhaps even that we end on this issue, I think it's, it's important to have this reality check that, um, you know, we all, everyone in this room knows that extremism has long been one of the, uh, Pakistan's major challenges. And so long as it persists, which it does, uh, a major source of, of instability will remain in place that really can jeopardize uh, a lot of the progress on national security uh, and uh, on, on the economy. And I think it's particularly important to highlight, given that as we've heard several times over the last few days, that the security situation really has improved in Pakistan uh, in recent years. Um, you know, if you look at the, uh, the statistics from the South Asia Terrorism Portal, for example, SATP, um, in both 2012 and 2013, about 3,000 civilians were killed in terrorist violence each of those years. Uh, then Pakistan launched its uh, counter-terrorism uh, offensive against anti-state militants in North Waziristan in 2014. After that, the figures started to fall significantly from less than 1,800 in 2014 down to uh, less than 950, then just over 600, and then 540 last year. And through this week, the figure is just over 300. Now, of course, one fatality is, is too many, uh, but the idea here is to highlight this striking drop in fatalities. And yet, this is a type of progress that can be jeopardized given the presence of extremism in Pakistan and the fact that extremism can lead to, to terrorism. Uh, you know, you have a number of educational, religious institutes that propagate ideologies of hate. Uh, powerful individuals with extremist views uh, are out there, frequently not sanctioned. Uh, and in recent months, we've seen a trend of uh, s uh, new religious parties, some of them with some pretty nasty rhetoric and points of views, entering politics and trying to get into the political mainstream. Some of them participated in the July uh, election. And of course, the state uh, has notorious ties to violent extremists, certainly the military, uh, but also civ uh, some civilian uh, politicians as well. And this exacerbates the problem. Uh, extremism is something that transcends socioeconomic considerations in Pakistan. There have been rich and poor and educated and uneducated and male and females with extremist views. Uh, you know, I think we, we, we all know the case of uh, the young man from, with a privileged background who went to the Institute of Business Administration, IBA, which is, as I understand it, the Harvard Business School of, of Pakistan. He was radicalized while doing an internship with the Unilever uh, Corporation. And he later was involved in the uh, killing of the human rights activist, Sabine Mahmoud, a few years ago. So this panel discussion tries to confront this issue of extremism, which we've all thought about and discussed so often before. But the question that we'd like, that I hope that we can get to is how to deal with it in a meaningful way. Um, can it be dealt with in a meaningful way, particularly given the political dynamics and current realities in, in Pakistan? And specifically, what is the role of society in Pakistan and the state in trying to deal um, with the problem? So we've got a great panel uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to very briefly introduce each of them. Uh, we're going to, f uh, once the panel begins, we're first going to hear from Imtiaz Gol, who, who we heard from already yesterday. Uh, he participated in our discussion on Af Afghanistan. He's executive director at the Center for Research and Security Studies in Islamabad, and he's a leading commentator on uh, issues regarding security and um, <coughs> religious radicalization, among other things. And his books include Pakistan, uh, pivot of Hizbut Tahrir's global caliphate. Uh, we also will hear from Raza Rumi, a very well-known figure, uh, who is the uh, director of the Park, or pardon me, the uh, yeah, the Park Center for Independent Media at Ithaca College. He's also a scholar in residence with the journalism department and a faculty member at the Park School of Communications. And he's also a visiting faculty member at Cornell. Uh, hopefully I have that all right. Uh, and then finally, we will be hearing from uh, Dr. Nilafar Siddiqui, 
who's an assistant professor of political science at the University at Albany State University of New York, and her research interests include political parties, political violence, uh, and the politics of religion and ethnicity. Uh, before we get to them, though, we wanted to uh, allow an opportunity for one of our spotlight speakers, uh, which again is someone that will come up and provide some, some scene setter remarks for the discussion that will follow. And the person that we're going to be calling on to do that for this, uh, this final panel is Dr. Pardon me, Javed Jabbar, um, who has done so many things. He's a retired senator and former federal minister. Um, he's been involved with filmmaking, writing, social issues, environmental issues. You'll see his bio. Uh, it'll give a good uh, indication of all that he's done. So if we could have um, Javed Jabbar come up to the podium and offer some brief comments. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, Michael Kuhlman, for your gracious introduction and the invitation to be part of this extremely stimulating and absorbing symposium these past two days. It's a privilege to be with these three panelists, even though you have not permitted me to sit uh, with them, but I shall <laughs> admire them from a distance as I have uh, looked at them with great respect. And it's so nice to know uh, of such distinguished persons who are present here, both from the United States and Pakistan in the Pakistani diaspora, of which we have heard so well in the last uh, session. Uh, friends, I think this concluding session, in a way, also briefly allows one to reflect on the richness of the inputs that have been shared in the past sessions, uh, in, on all, virtually all aspects of Pakistan. And to come to this session with the task of looking at state, society, and extremism uh, may first suggest that all the good things that have, for example, been illustrated in the previous session uh, go up in thin smoke because, after all, extremism is the bane of Pakistan and Pakistan's name has become so synonymous with it. And is that fair? And is it fair to be so exclusively associated with Pakistan or with countries like Pakistan, particularly Muslim countries like Pakistan, even though every country is unique? So to be fair to extremism and to be fair to Pakistan, extremism has more or less been a historic condition in virtually all human societies. The job of civilization is obviously to manage those extremities and prevent those extremisms from becoming destructive. But look at the world today in 2018. I'm reminded of Eric Hopshaw's masterful work that history he wrote called The Age of Extremes. And he looked at the early 20th century. My God, uh, he should be asked to come back from heaven and rewrite it for the 21st century. In virtually every sphere, in the intellectual sphere, in climate change, in race, in immigration, in trade, in hate and suspicion, in the misuse of propaganda and information. This is the age of extremes. Extremism is rampant. Never before at the highest levels of the state or government have we heard invective of the kind that we hear today. And I shall not specify the country. So this is an age of extremism. And let me name some of the countries. Let me begin with Pakistan. Yes, Pakistan has extremism. But so does Saudi Arabia. So does Syria. So does Russia. Myanmar. <laughs> Brazil. Brazil is about to hopefully not elect an extremist. India. There have been lynchings of Muslims. Uh, the United States and Hungary, the list goes on. Let me begin, therefore, with some of the good extremisms. You know, some extremisms, if they're positive, if they're constructive, there's nothing wrong with being extremist. And Pakistan is a classic example of a country that comes into being with no historic identity, barely 71 years of existence, first country to disintegrate after the Second World War, 
and puts itself back together again in these past four decades. And without a historic national identity like the Turkish or the Russian or the Egyptian or the French or the British people, we have today in Pakistan a Pakistaniyat, people who are proud to be Pakistani with all the warts and the flaws that we have. And that's an extreme passion. We are passionate about being Pakistani, hopefully always in a non-violent way. We are an exceedingly friendly and hospitable people. I dare say myself, but all of you are welcome. Do give me advance notice. Mm -hmm. But truly, ask any foreigner who comes to Pakistan for the first time. You barely meet a stranger for the first time. He's invited right into the house for dinner, for lunch. My God, it takes Japanese about 10 years to get him to invite you to his house. We do it in the flash of an eye. We are a very compassionate country, people. And I don't agree with that index which ranks us low, uh, quoted in the previous session. I think we belong right up on top in the first five, first ten. The rich give more money in our country, but the poor give more frequently than the rich. Remarkable. We are 97% Muslim, fervently Muslim, but we are enormously diverse in every respect, lifestyle, culture, language, ethnicity, extreme diversity. And despite the low ranking in HRD, human resource development, abysmal, we don't deserve to be where we are. We are a highly gifted people, extremely innovative. The previous session hinted at that. But I have the privilege of my voluntary work that takes me into contact with the grassroots in over 3,000 locations across Pakistan, all four provinces. And I marvel at the ingenuity and the courage of illiterate, uneducated village women or men who deal with complex local problems and solve them as they exist in the cities. So that's my opening commercial for Pakistan since we don't do any advertising like <laughs> India does. What are the factors that shape the social psyche of extremism? They may be self-evident, but I need to list them. First, religion. And religion counts for most people. Even in Europe, the ruling party of the Federal German Republic still calls itself the Christian Democratic Party. And there's a church tax, mind you, in several European countries. They should get rid of this anomaly. I don't know why they charge people for their religion. And religion affects lifestyle. Do you put on a burqa? Do you put on a hijab? Do you grow a beard out of religious piety? But religion certainly exerts an influence on us at least. Work, livelihoods, where you get your daily bread and butter, your income level, uh, the community, the clan, the language that you speak, the interactions with them, the level of literacy, education, access to mainstream media, the use of this terrible thing called social media, uh, the collective memory of a people, uh, what kind of grievance or sense of persecution one has inherited, and then the individual perception about collective memory. <coughs> And the perception about the state. What kind of a state am I living in? Is it being fair to me? And then finally, I suppose, voting preferences. Who do I actually go and vote for when it comes to ballot time? And from there, we naturally lead into the causes of extremism. What could be the causes? That's a mystery. First of all, of course, inherited biases that come to us with our parents and our ancestors, the inflections about who is a Sunni, who is a Shia, who is a Hindu, even if it's not explicitly stated, it's passed on. And then, fueled by ignorance, if you start with inherited bias and you add ignorance to it, which you do very little to diminish, uh, then that bias grows like a worm within the mind. A misinformation about someone who is not like you. 
And then incitement, subtle as well as crude. Second, completely different factor, economic deprivation, even though, as we know, 9-11 didn't show economic deprivation, and an example that Michael quoted. But poverty, possibly, yes, in the case of suicide bombers especially, the cannon fodder, unemployment, dispossession. And third, individual pathology. That Norwegian who on the 22nd of July 2011, he was not poor. He sets out, sets off a bomb at a government building, then goes and cold-bloodedly executes 68 people enjoying a holiday, young people. So that individual pathology that suddenly goes berserk. And new, uh, new personal causes which adopt other causes. Why is there such injustice in Kashmir? Why has the world and the United States turned its eyes away from the thousands of youth being persecuted every day? Rage, Palestine. Yeah. Also, demand for secession, secession from the state. Uh, the Naxalites in India reject the Indian state structure. Perhaps a few Baloch youth do that with Pakistan. And then lastly, perhaps the reason, huh, when you try to counter that extremism, it's come up in my notes out of sequence. But it's lovely to say things out of sequence. Uh, language extremism. In my country, the word secularism is translated into Urdu as atheism. In Urdu, it means la diniyat, which means without faith. Now, in a country, 97% Muslim, uh, that is heresy. And it is not meant to be uh, atheism. We know that. I, Whenever I speak in villages or colleges or universities, and I've never been challenged on this, I hope I never am, I say it's actually har diniyat, meaning all faiths. Secularism means respect every religion, particularly those which are not your own, which is not your own religion. But it has been mistranslated. And it's part of the psyche of young Pakistanis and old Pakistanis. That secularism, anti-Islam, atheism. So we come now to, let us say, the hard nuts and bolts of negative extremism, the most, the greatest threat not only to Pakistan, but to our neighbors, perhaps, and to the rest of the world. I classify three types of religion-based extremism. The first is violent religious extremism on the basis of sect, on the basis of someone who is not a Muslim, or simply some religious, violent religious extremists do not accept the Islamic Republic of Pakistan as a state. They may live in it, but they don't accept it. And I want to point out at this stage, apropos a remark about how some extremists are now being mainstreamed into the political process in Pakistan. This is not a new phenomenon. There used to be a party called the Jamiatul Ulema Pakistan, headed by a man called Maulana Shah Nurani from the Barelvi sect, the Green Turban sect very distinct from the puritanical Diobandi sect. And I think this new uh, entity called Tehrik Labayak e Pakistan has harnessed a lot of that latent vote, added potency to it, and made it incendiary. But it's not a new development. The second I would call is non-physically violent, but verbally violent religious extremism. And that is also very disturbing. It exists. It exists in sermons from mosques. It exists in false charges of blasphemy against people who you don't like or who you want to grab their property. Uh, it exists in hate material, which is printed and distributed. It also occurs sometimes in the content on mass media uh, and gets away with it because it has the dawn, the religious garb. So you're not supposed to challenge a guy who has a beard and who speaks Arabic. So 
anything he says has to be accepted. And then there is another, a third category, which I call non-verbally violent. It's neither physically violent nor verbally violent, but it creates a passive kind of extremism. And it's particularly evident in our educational institutions, also in conservative orthodox middle classes, who simply accept whatever, whatever has been told to them that this is Islam, this is what the Quran means, full of false quotations from the hadith, the sayings of the Prophet. And those characters don't go out and burn anything or kill anyone, but they're carrying that mindset around all the time. And the internet helps propagate that. And it's also evident in schools. Second, some state institutions in Pakistan are extremist. And uh, inadvertently or deliberately. And when I say this, I'm not accusing the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of being a fanatic. It's just that he developed, he's developed this fondness for going into hospitals and surprising doctors. And the whole medical and health system is shaken up and he walks into district courts, that's better. Uh, but he is sometimes, I don't know whether this I'll be called in for contempt of court, he reminds me of a bull in a china shop. <laughs> and you can't predict where he's going to turn up. And this is extreme, I think, inappropriate use of the position that he has uh, held. And he, I'm sure he does it out of good intent, but the effect is very disruptive. There is extremism in the way our anti-corruption bodies uh, literally and figuratively nab people without adequately preparing the evidence, besmirching their reputations, and not being able to prove their cases in court. And this carries on down the line to the judiciary. The judiciary is in such a hurry to deliver verdicts that the verdict disqualifying Nawaz Sharif was so full of flaws, of language, sentence, construction, a legal argument that I doubt it will be uh, possible for a high court or a supreme court to uh, sustain it. And the excessive use of force by law enforcers, uh, torture in police stations, uh, the mistreatment of citizens, this is very rampant, very common. And the role of both civil and military intelligence agencies. Uh, often, they probably do it out of good intent because it's very difficult to gather evidence. So they have to get results, uh, but it certainly has reached an extreme. And then, of course, uh, bad governance, uh, bad governance which Dr. Ishrat has very ably addressed. Third category, the partisan invective of political parties which is really, in my humble view, the poison of democracy. It has driven schisms in America, it infects Britain, it poisons India, and it poisons Pakistan. It debilitates democracy. And humanity has to evolve a less adversarial, less abrasive, less confrontational form of authentic democracy. But that is certainly fueling extremism, extremism of the mindset, polarizing viewpoints across divides on issues like water, dam construction, citizenship for refugees who've been with us for 30, 40 years, uh, and lawyers, lawyers in our country in certain cities take the law into their own hands, and they become partisans against the judiciary and against the police. The fourth, oh, the genie that went out of the bottle when in the third cabinet that I served, we introduced private, independent, electronic media. <laughs> the media have absolutely become anarchic. And the concept of freedom of expression, which is used immediately the moment any attempt is made to regulate, and the judiciary collaborates with media owners in allowing this anarchy to flourish. Because every time the regulatory body issues a show cause notice to a media owner, all he has to do is hire an ex expensive lawyer, go to the high court, gets a stay order. A stay order is meant for two weeks. 
Stay orders in Pakistan last for two years, four years, five years. Religious TV channels operate without a license because they've got stay orders. So the judiciary is as responsible for the chaos, confusion, acrimony, and sense of grievance promoted every single day by a media that has gone beyond regulation. But something has to be done about it. The last of the extremities I want to flag is high population growth. We love making babies. But we are the largest Muslim country now, shamefully. <laughs> Even the theocratically ruled Islamic Republic of Pakistan has a contraceptive usage <clears throat> rate amongst married couples that is over 75%. Turkey is over 70%. Bangladesh, 60%. Pakistan, 35%. We have to come to terms with this. And political leadership at the highest level has not yet had the courage to look this problem in the eye and talk about it. And the out-of-school children I don't want to talk about. Now let me come to the second and the last part. And uh, before Michael comes and sh sh shuts off the mic. Actually, I was just about to threaten to do that. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so just I if you could wrap just up in take a few two, minutes. Two so. or three minutes? Three minutes, yes. We, when we say state and society, it sounds very nice. Singular, singular is state, singular is society. But the fact is, the state is a very segmented, splintered structure. There's no such thing as a unity in the state structure, that if you, the state wants something, it shall be done. The state itself has three pillars. Uh, and then you've got the 18th Amendment from 2010. The four provinces have their own, uh, own agendas, their own perspectives. So when we are talking about the state, what is the state? The state is a coalition of various institutions that have to be coordinated, and often that is not possible. We have an eroded center, tragically, at a time when we need a strong center. The executive itself is eroded, and the judiciary has sharp contrast. I just want to say that in respect of the military's role, in 2018, on the basis of my frequent interaction with civil and military training institutions, I can say, civil and military are on the same page. And the military is not the military of General Ziaullah. Like other institutions, it is also changing and evolving. It recognizes the perils that Pakistan has paid, the price we have paid for the military's past association with religious uh, figures. And it wants to modulate and control that. So the way forward need for the political leadership of Pakistan to catch up with the people. The people are far ahead of the political leadership when it comes to recognizing the perils posed from violent religious extremism. And the results of the July 2018 polls show that conclusively all religious political parties have failed miserably at the polls this incredible enlightenment of the Pakistani voter. And let me also tell you, for the first time in 71 years, three non-Muslim candidates contesting on general seats, not reserved seats, Hindus, three Pakistani Hindus in Sindh have got more votes than the Muslim candidates competing against them. What a change. What maturity of the people of Pakistan. The leaders need to recognize that. They need to use mechanisms like the Council of Common Interests, a constitutional body, the Interprovincial Coordination Committee, to make this state structure more cohesive and responsive to what the citizens want. Comprehensive reform of education. I just want to say, the madrasas don't exist only inside madrasas. Many of the government schools, many private schools, also bear a madrasa mentality, which means we have, to reach, we have to train teachers on a massive basis. Media regulation, I've already talked about, we have to tackle that without being overawed by the media. Civil society has its role, religious parties, and lastly, where do I end? The chief of army staff, the current chief of army staff, set an excellent example. In December 2017, 
he became the first serving chief of army staff to have a closed door session with the Senate of Pakistan. It lasted four hours. Every kind of question was exchanged, including the alleged support of the military to extremism. That kind of dialogue needs to be held more frequently with the National Assembly and even at the provincial level. Far greater interactions between the civil and the military to institutionalize this. We need to learn how have other societies coped with extremism. And I think we have the basic DNA of being a pluralist, respectful society, the overwhelming majority of Pakistanis. Thank you very much for your questions. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Jabbar. We appreciate the very rich uh, context that you provided. So let's go into the panel. So uh, we start with uh, Imtiaz Goal. Thank you very much. Did you conspire against me? You know, <laughs> I thought, you know, Javed Saab just oversaw what I was writing. <laughs> so he's... <laughs> so I it made your job easy for you. So <laughs> maybe I, I, I should think, you know, just skipping my, my talk, <laughs> you know. Just because a lot of things uh, he said excellently, the, I, I can't match his eloquence. Uh, so this has put me in uh, my notes in a little bit of disarray. Uh, just because I'll be saying things at the cost of uh, uh, reputation. But anyway, very quickly, I, uh, I'll still uh, probably go through. Um, when we talk of extremism or radicalization, uh, you know, in the context of Pakistan, what is it actually? Is it radicalization, extremism, or essentially growing social intolerance, you know, out of uh, frustration, denial of justice and rights. Uh, what is it actually? Or is it a social way of life to express anger, frustration, or a structured, systematic use of faith by groups or individuals? The latter, basically, I, as a practitioner, I would say, has certainly been used to stigmatize Pakistan to stigmatize the discourse, socio-political discourse in Pakistan, disregarding all the other factors, or, or the other dimensions, as uh, Javed Saab has just uh, illustrated here. There's a tendency I've seen um, all over the world, wherever I've gone, to look at Pakistan as a cocooned entity, as a laboratory where you can engineer change, where you can, you know, Try ch and then if you fail, you say this is a failed state, there's extremism and there's radicalization here. Um, the basic questions that we were asked to deal with, whether, you know, what's the role of the army, is it part of the solution or part of the problem, where does the civilian, uh, civilian dispensation stand, uh, and what's the way forward. So if we were to explain the Pakistani context, uh, I think Javed Jabbar Sahib has really laid that bare, that um, in, in, in the way we have seen, uh, one of my colleagues is also sitting here, we started working on that in 2011 on counter-radicalization projects in Pakistan, that there's been a propensity uh, in Pakistan to view the world through the religious prism, and thereby deviation from constitutionalism. This is the uh, conclusion that I reached, that uh, while we were seen as religiously extremist or radical country, the primary reason for that in Pakistan has been this deviation from the constitution, from the rule of law, abuse of law, little less uh, certainty of punishment, tardy and expensive uh, justice system, and ignorance of fundamental rights of all citizens, regardless you know, of caste, creed, and faith. This basically encouraged a sense of impunity and emboldened also non-state actors, which in the past had been also associated with uh, some state institutions, uh, into taking the law uh, in their own hand or in trying to impose their own will on segments of the society. They basically turned the state weaknesses into their narrative, into their narrative, and then we started hearing of uh, this terminology, counter-narrative, countering violent extremism, uh, all the terminology that was imported, imposed on Pakistan, and I, as a Pakistani, for the first time objected to this at a Brussels international conference in November 2012, that somehow CVE denoted Muslim societies. I stood there and said, 
is it fair? It was a hundred, representatives of 100 countries saying, uh, and they basically wanted to push that agenda of CVE. And I said, look, it's not just the Muslims. You know, it's Tamil Tigers were never Muslims, but they were equally violent. And there are many other examples. So I thought that this is how, you know, we deviated, uh, our society was deviated partially, state institutions were also responsible for that from constitutionalism. So what the recipe that we came up with was, we really need to connect, reconnect the citizens and the leaders with the constitution as a measure of counter-radicalization. So this is what we started off, this is what we are uh, doing right now. Now, the, since there's a lot of talk of radicalization in the Pakistani society, um, the question is, does it really translate into mass support for religio-political parties? Or does it lead to radicalization? So look at the election results. We recently had elections. They are out of 342 seats of the lower house of parliament, only 16 sit with religio-political parties. Only 16. The total vote, hardly 4%. Only 13 of the 99 seats in the Khyber Pukhtunkhwa uh, Assembly, the province which has been badly affected by the first Afghan war and the second Afghan war, they just went to Jamiyat Ulama Islam. They, there are you know, pe uh, b Muslim believers, so they obviously they, this party has a constituency there. Elections 2013, it was uh, the uh, votes or, or the seats for religious political parties were not even 5%. So I keep wondering on what basis do people call Pakistan an extremist society or radical society? Compare it with India. Uh, Bharatiya Janata Party uh, had 282 seats. Uh, then in all, the alliance that it leads of all right-wing radical parties, in all is 336 seats in the parliament of uh, 542 members. So who is radical? The RSS, BJP, Shiv Sena led uh, Democra National Democratic Alliance in India, or Pakistan where these parties don't have even 5% representation in the parliament. Tariq el yeah, there's a lot of talk of that, of mainstreaming and this and that. Well, that is a latent attitude in every society. When uh, President Trump spoke about, uh, yeah, there are fine people on both sides after Charlotte. So what was that? What, you know, people forget about this. And when Jeff Sessions spoke about, you know, drew, drew on, the, on the Bible, when it, it was dealing with this uh, immigra immigration issues. What was that? Faith as an instrument of politics, as uh, populism, or radicalization? So you know, we really have to be very dispassionate and a little uh, deeply dig deep into, into the analysis when judging a particular society. So let's not conflate radicalization with increased religiosity. Yes. There is increased religiosity. There are reasons for this. Uh, again, the reasons are, could be poverty. The reasons could be the abuse of law by the political elites, the abuse of law by the military. You know, we've seen three uh, military coups. Uh, but does this really mean that people are really religious? They, everybody's out to kill the other one. No, it's not, it's not like, I think we have failed as a, as a nation. The Pakistanis failed in projecting the country as a, as a country where the mainstream vote goes to the mainstream parties, not to the religious funders. And this I'm saying because in, back in 2000, uh, the Bloomberg correspondent based in Mumbai, he, I invited him to Pakistan. Imagine it was 2000. And I told him to start his journey from Karachi and Lahore and come to Islamabad. And he said, after one week, I'm bowled over. I said, what happened? He said, you know, I had imagined a different Pakistan. I thought it would be like Afghanistan, people, bearded people, turbaned people, women in burqas. So, which means, Javed Saab, I think, with due apologies, your generation, my generation basically failed in projecting this image. Uh, then, um, I'll just quickly, do I have another two minutes? Two minutes, yeah. Okay. What has the state done? Um, the state has uh, not done much. 
the, there was National Counterterrorism Authority. It did a lot of work. In the Pakistani context, you know, it's a partially dysfunctional bureaucracy torn between the military and the civilian government. It still created a lot of task forces. I've been part of the steering committee. They come, came up with a national narrative, national uh, uh, anti-terrorism narrative, and national security policy. But what was the problem? The problem was the ownership of the entire process. Uh, the Mus we had a very detailed interview with the former coordinator of NACTA very recently, about two months ago. And he very candidly, after he retired. That's why he was able to speak candidly. Mm -hmm. So he said, NACTA's performance has been significantly impacted by the lack of ownership by the Prime Minister, Nawaz Sharif, and the Ministry of Interior, who attempted to treat NACTA as their surrogate, rather than according it the kind of independence that this uh, uh, entity needed. Then he also said, contrary to, contrary to the general notion, the military has been very cooperative and sometimes even more eager to lend their helping hand than the civilians themselves. So you know, when again we talk, come to the civil military equation, there's a lot of talk about that out of context. So this I have seen myself how the, uh, the military was more eager and the civilians didn't want to simply take, do the hard, dirty work. What is the dirty work for the civilians, for the military public representatives, for the members of parliament? Can they engage with a, with a mosque, with a madrasa, to, to stem the hate speech that emanates from the pulpit? No, nobody wants to take that. Are they ready to legislate uh, when it comes to penalizing hate speech, when it, it comes to reforming the criminal justice system. No, it's the job of the parliament. They haven't done it. We have been crying the past 10 years that we need urgently need criminal justice reform so that to, to avoid the, this uh, uh, pendency, the huge number of cases that are there pending in the courts. But so far, we haven't heard much. So you, when we talk of the way forward, what needs to be done? Basically, what Javed Saab just said, politicians and members of parliament have to take direct charge of socio-politically challenging job. And that job is curricular reform to induce critical thinking, which has been missing. I think Nadia was talking about it uh, in our curricula because it's rote learning. Incentivizing public sector education to wean poor families away from the religious schools where they send their one or two children, boys, to, uh, just because they can't afford the normal school. Leading the community for a law-based engagement with the mosque and madaris. You know, without that, it won't, the army is not going to control the mosque or, or the madrasa. It's for the parliament, for the civilian governments, provincial and the, and the national, and push for criminal justice reform. Without the criminal justice reform, I don't think Pakistan will have much success in dealing with the consequences of religious extremism, of the hate speech, of all sorts of violations. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And it sounds like for so many years we've been hearing about this, the, the essence of education reforms and criminal justice reforms. It's the same ideas that keep coming up. Uh, anyway, thank you. Raza Rumi. Thanks, uh, <clears throat> Mike. I should have gone first because a lot of what I wanted to say has, <laughs> has, been, no, has already will, been... Now he will repent. Uh, yes, I, I, I am <laughs> repenting because uh, Javed Jabbar so eloquently... Uh, <coughs> presented the, the lay of the land, and uh, Imtiaz um, referred to a lot of points that I was going to make. So um, I just want to quickly uh, say that uh, the problem of extremism in Pakistan, I mean, it's, uh, it's linked to the imagination of, uh, and there has been a contest uh, from the very start uh, of the country's uh, birth. You know, Pakistan's founder, uh, who was a constitutional lawyer and a a modern Muslim, as we would call, very clearly in his first address as the governor general, uh, laid out the future roadmap for Pakistan. You know, in his uh, inaugural speech on 11th August uh, 1947, he made it very clear that the, that the state would have no business 
of uh, regulating religion or stopping people from going to temples or mosques and therefore gave a very inclusive and a pluralistic vision for Pakistan. Unfortunately, successive governments and leaders in Pakistan uh, have failed uh, the founder and the uh, the the philosophy be, uh, behind Pakistan's creation. A lot of uh, people in Pakistan think that Pakistan was somehow uh, meant to create an Islamic state or, or, or whatever, but the reality is that Pakistan came into birth as a struggle uh, between mi minority and ma majority rights in the united India. And uh, the Muslims who were a minority wanted political and economic and social and cultural safeguards. And Mr. Jenner fought that case effectively and finally got a country where the minority uh, could uh, uh, sort of rule uh, itself and have a tolerant and a pluralistic society. And that is why in his first speech, he also emphasized the protection of minorities and kept on saying, unfortunately, as, as we all know uh, the history that he did not... Uh, uh, stay very long as the governor general and he died almost a year after Pakistan's creation. And uh, over uh, the decades, uh, what has happened is that most political leaders in Pakistan have used that religious identity for political purposes very uh, shamefully and very brazenly. And, uh, you know, and that includes the right wing leaders that also includes in, uh, includes the liberal and secular Democrats like, like Mr. Bhutto, who ruled Pakistan in the, in the 1970s. In fact, a lot of what we are witnessing in contemporary Pakistan is rooted in the experience of 1970s when Mr. Bhutto uh, laid the foundation of sectarianism in the constitution of Pakistan by declaring a group of people as non-Muslims, perhaps the only parliament in the world which took upon itself to declare people's faith or find them <coughs> believers or non-believers. And I think, th and that has uh, sparked off a, a, a chain reaction through the decades. So, you know, it is very difficult. Of course, we all, General Ziaul Haq succeeded Bhutto and he cemented it and furthered uh, the whole institutional re-engineering and social re-engineering for his own legitimacy and political purposes. But, you know, um, uh, that's that the Zeolak is an easy target. The military is an easy target. You know, the riddle and the problem is is way way deeper uh, than than we think. And and I'm and I'm going into history. I know Michael, you advise us not to go look back, but you know, without looking back, there there's no looking in the future. And I think that is where Pakistan's leadership. I would take forward what uh, Mr. Jabbar and uh, and Imtiaz Gul mentioned. Uh, that it is up to Pakistan's leadership to uh, to actually uh, create a, a, a perhaps a new vision, a new imagination for Pakistan, a country which is uh, at peace with itself, which is inclusive, which does not discriminate against people on the basis of their faith, sect, caste, or creed, and that that will be actually going back to the uh, original idea of Pakistan, as many of us un un understand that. And uh, unfortunately, in Bhutto's and Zaulak's time, we also know the the uh, seismic events of 1979 when Iranian revolution and the Afghan invasion spurred a geopolitical curse on Pakistan, and Pakistan became a kind of a laboratory, a, a to stop the Shiite revolution from traveling uh, elsewhere, and B, fighting the Cold War with the U.S. and the Saudis and and, and everybody knows that history. And in that time period, we did undergo a major uh, re-engineering in terms of our educational system, our curricula changes, uh, the way state fashion. So, so a lot of these ideas about Pakistan has to be an Islamic state and all of that. You know, I was growing up in that time period, so I have a first-hand observational uh, experience other than uh, what I've read or, or learned from uh, seniors uh, like Imtiaz and Javed Saab is the, is the fact that we saw that Pakistan's television changed overnight with mullahs taking more and more airspace with women, uh, newscasters who did not cover their head. Uh, there were TV plays in which women uh, were, were sleeping in the bed wearing a scarf because you you could only show a woman with a scarf. You know, we we, we grew up with that. So, you know, it was a very much a state project of radicalization for whatever external jihad or, or justifying or legitimacy. And unfortunately that, you know, it's been a generation and a generation has grown up.
with those ideas, with those textbooks, with those narratives, and they believe in these supremacist things. They believe that Muslims are superior to non-Muslims. I used to believe that as a young man when I went to college uh, to study at the age of 18 to UK. I also believed in the idea that I was superior because I was a Muslim, because that's what my my teachers had, had instilled in my, in my head. I mean, it took me many years to uh, sort of uh, undo that but you know that is what our education system does and let's face it we have to change it so I I mean I feel that much has been said about that and, and you know madrasas are easy to target easy to pinpoint I mean they're just what 30,000 or so and only five to seven percent of total school going kids actually go to madrasas let's also face the the facts you know 95 percent of children go to state-run schools which not only other than the curricular problems have also very weak uh, you know literacy and numeracy skills the teachers are not trained and there's a whole huge uh, project and task uh, uh, you know waiting for the for the new government to take up which is to fix the public uh, sector education system and change the curricula i think some of it was mentioned in the morning as well i think the other important so at this point, I'll just stop and I'll just uh, remind everybody that, uh, you know, Imtiaz Saab mentioned the national efforts in countering extremism and terrorism. So there is an unfinished state project, you know. After this, uh, after the Zia decade was over, we had a spell of a, de a, a decade of weak civilian governments, which could not, because they were weak, they were frequently changing. There were nine prime ministers between 1988 and 1999. I mean, how could you have policy stability <clears throat> of any kind? You know, it takes uh, one to two years just to draft something and, and get some ownership uh, in the country. And not much was done to do that. And I, and I think then again, the war on terror, uh, led us to that part. We we have security interests in Afghanistan. Let's also face them very clearly. And Pakistani state is not willing to give those up uh, that easily because of various ra ra reasons which are beyond the purview of this panel. But the reality is that Pakistani state and, and most importantly its military did uh, sort of, you know, undertake a transformation after the Peshawar uh, children's uh, uh, Peshawar school massacre at the end of 2014. And thereafter, uh, uh, not only the military, but also uh, very senior state officials uh, did decide to uh, change the course by taking proactive measures, whether and, uh, and the civil and the military leadership came up with a national action plan, um, you know, in at the end of 2014. And then there were subsequent documents. And unfortunately, that's a project which is lying unfinished. So the hard part, the easy part, was to go and attack uh, the hideouts of terrorists, clean up the areas, territories which were under the control of the Taliban, Pakistani branch of Taliban and the sectarian militias. And that was effectively done. And that is why the terrorism figures that you cited, Michael, at the start of uh, our, our, our discussion make sense because that, that particular task has been successfully achieved uh, by, the, by the army, the rangers, the police and other law enforcement apparatus. The, the more difficult part to deal, to deal with this generation of radicalization, state-sponsored narratives is, remains, and, and it remains unfinished. And some of it has to do with the way we have allowed, uh, since the time of General Ziaul Haq, the mosque and madrasa complex to operate, grow, manifold, unregulated. In most countries, even in, Islam, in, in many Muslim countries, Friday sermons uh, have some sort of regulation. There, there's some sort of discussion about them, not in Pakistan, where you could just say anything. At the same time, what is taught in madrasas in terms of, uh, and in fact, I'm not an advocate of banning and you know, people <coughs> say we have to close down madrasas. I, I don't think, I think they're playing a very vital role for the poor families. And it, the only uh, tough part is to bring them in the mainstream, regulate their curricula, check the quality of their teachers and what they're teaching and perhaps modernize them. And, and other countries are doing that. In Indonesia, some efforts have taken place. In parts of India, some initiatives are underway. And definitely that's not unachievable. Um, and, uh, and the second part, which uh, Mr. Jabbar also highlighted about the media, uh, the, the beast we call media. So even prior to the deregulation of the electronic media, 
uh, during the decade of Ziaul Haq, the right wing had had found a foothold in Pakistan's tra tra traditional media. So, you know, we have leading columnists in, in Urdu who can just say anything what they would, they have a standard formula. They will cite one or two religious, uh, you know, scriptures. They will cite a saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And within that framework, they can write anything. So the, my, my, my favorite, uh, uh, in a perverse way, column uh, is, is, the, is the one where Dr. Abdul Salam, the first Nobel laureate in physics, how one leading columnist wrote that, you know, basically uh, um, he heard from someone that uh, Dr. Abdul Salam was plotting with, uh, with the international Zionist uh, forces to denuclearize Pakistan. And because he was a physics uh, PhD and that was and 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 he and he, he he was citing all fake false cooked up testimonies, and because if because you uh, you get that kind of space and uh, nobody checks you and because you you have cited some religious uh, you know texts so people are also very careful in, in in challenging that and that unfortunately culture has now spilled over into the mainstream electronic media since 2002 you can basically say anything on national. I was part of TV for three, four years, and I know that you know it. it there's no, there's no editorial control. I mean, if you want to uh, uh, speak against someone, level of false accusation, spread of fake news, and most importantly is the is the discourse of extremism there are a couple of tv anchors who are well known to those who uh, follow pakistani media closely who say the most vile things not just you know uh, you, uh, pro taliban pro iss uh, narratives you know uh, totally unchecked unregulated unedited and that that fuels uh, the radicalization that we've been talking about. I think I think it's a, it's a, it's about time that the media industry has to uh, sort of sit down and set some standards and and re uh, rethink the institution of editor, which is actually dying and extinct. And I'm I'm an editor myself, so I I can tell you by experience that it is it is a, 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 a severely endangered species. In TV, it's completely gone. In print, it's also under severe threat. And finally, I think this whole discussion about uh, political mainstreaming, etc., I think but what we have to do and the new government has to do is find a credible and a, and a proper framework for reintegration of the former militants. Pakistan uh, state has in the last three, four years, uh, you know, targeted many groups. There are many uh, uh, groups who could be brought into uh, the mainstream through a properly well-executed program and not just by letting them get, you know, go to elections or, or contest as political parties. I mean, there are UN uh, uh, frameworks of DDR, you know, disarmament, demobilization and reintegration. And we have to perhaps find a homegrown solution because if we are cracking down on the militant groups, if we are cracking down on, on the militias, there are hundreds and thousands of young men who may be out of work or out of, uh, you know, uh, their their job. So what are they going to do? I mean, are they going to stay demobilized and de-radicalized for how long? Because they, as long as there's a regional conflict, as long as there are, <coughs> there are uh, political uh, uh, imperatives of keeping religious extremism alive, we, uh, they may get, slip back into the fold of militancy and uh, radical extremism. So I think um, uh, based on on uh, uh, on these things, I would just highlight uh, three or four things. I mean, uh, you mentioned NACTA, the National Counterterrorism Authority. I think uh, there's a uh, there was an absence of leadership. The prime minister, former prime minister Nawaz Sharif, I think only chaired one se or, or not even one session of NACTA. So you can imagine what kind of political leadership it got. And then he got into a spat with his own interior minister because the interior minister wanted to control NACTA. And, the, and uh, by law, uh, it was designed to be led by the prime minister. You know, its budget was um, uh, slashed, I think, at least twice in the uh, in the previous years, whatever. So, you know, that's what happens with soft kind of uh, reform. Whenever there's a, uh, you know, cut in, cut in expenditure, the first target is the soft uh, stuff like NACTA. And I think uh, the the um, uh, pending tasks under NAP, particularly in uh, seminaries uh, regulation, in, curb, in finding ways to curb hate speech, I mean, that is something uh, that the new government must take up. And uh, uh, 
I think we also need to, the new parliament must go back to uh, some of the constitutional and legal provisions which allow for radicalization, whether it is the declaration of the Ahmadis as non-Muslims, whether it is a draconian blasphemy law which is, which is misused every now and then. Now people have property disputes and they file a blasphemy case or allegation against another person. So as long as there's a bad law on the books, you, it's open to abuse and, and the parliament has to take a, le a leadership role. I mean, there's just no, uh, you know, getting cowed down by, by one or two extremist mullahs. Or a, or a group of uh, mullahs is not the answer. And I think um, uh, this particular, uh, all of this must come in the framework of a, of, of a pending item for ages, which is the criminal justice uh, sector reform, uh, which has already been mentioned, because until the justice system is not fixed, all of these uh, uh, you know, particular issues cannot be uh, taken, um, uh, you know, uh, implemented. I think the final thing I would like to uh, emphasize uh, would be uh, the, uh, the importance of um, uh, of perhaps uh, thinking of a new direction and a new uh, sort of narrative for Pakistan. What is Pakistan going to be? Is it a, is it going to be a modern uh, state? Uh, you know, a, a modern territorial state uh, which protects its people and works for their welfare. <laughs> Or is it going to be the kind of imagina Im imaginary that was popularized by General Ziaul Haq, that it is a fortress of Islam out to save every Muslim on the planet with a nuke uh, that it ho holds? I think we have, to, uh, we have to take stock of that and prevent our young generation and our children from imbibing these, uh, these, uh, these uh, esoteric ideas while forgetting about on all our own territory and our own welfare. So I think... Uh, uh, the uh, the evolution of a modern nation state is itself a pending uh, agenda in Pakistan. It it got interrupted somewhere uh, in all these discourses that we have popularized, and I think it is time to revert to that and think of ways for Pakistan's future which are less radicalized and less violent. Well, thank you very much. Um, let's go to uh, Dr. Siddiqui. Great, thank you, Michael. And thanks also to the Wilson Center and Indus for organizing such an impressive event. I'm very excited to be speaking with you all today and I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion in 12 to 15 minutes. Um, so at Michael's request, <laughs> um, at Michael's request, I'll be confining my remarks primarily to the role played by Islamist political parties in the country. And in particular, the role played by these newer um, so-called hardline parties that we have seen enter the political sphere in the last few years, and I'll be examining what their presence might mean for the future of radicalization in the country. So to do so, I want to make three overarching points, um, and each of these will be addressing three distinct questions. So first, who are these new hardline parties, and how different are they really from the parties that we might be more familiar with, such as the Jamaat-e Islami or the Jamaat-e Ulema Islam or JUI? Second, can bringing them into the political mainstream moderate them, their tactics, and their ideology, as scholars of Islamist parties in other contexts have observed and suggested. And then finally, who supports them, and what does this mean about radicalization in society more broadly? So notwithstanding the important points that were made by um, my fellow panelists about the generally dismal performance of the Islamist parties in the recent polls and polls historically in Pakistan, I think it's still worth spending some time thinking about potential and possible trends and future scenarios. So to answer my first question, I wanted to provide a brief overview of these newer hardline parties. The 2018 election saw the emergence of two new religious parties, which captured the attention of both domestic and foreign observers alike. So the first, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, is the Tehrik al lebek Pakistan, or the TLP, which is a Burilvi party that um, brought the country to a standstill last November as a result of protests that they staged, um, which were protesting an alleged change made to an election law that was seen as somehow supporting or benefiting the ostracized Ahmadi minority group. The party has overtly violent origins. It was formed to support Mumtaz Qadri, who's the assassin murderer of Salman Tasir, the governor of Punjab, for defending the, um, the rights of a woman accused of blasphemy. And then earlier this year in May, a man claiming to be a member of the TLP shot and wounded um, the 
Park Sun interior minister at the time, also once again accusing him of blasphemy. Since the elections in which the party um, did surprise many by receiving the fifth highest vote share in the country, the TLP has once again both staged and threatened to stage a number of protests on a lot of issues, again, related to blasphemy. So the first concerned a um, blasphemous caricature contest that was being held in the Netherlands, and the party asked the government to um, end diplomatic relations with the Netherlands. And then the more recent threat of protest came um, earlier this week, at the end of last week, concerning the possible suspension of a death sentence against a woman, Asya Bibi, accused of, death, accused of blasphemy. So a video statement was released by the party, and it said in no uncertain terms, and I'm going to quote here, that if Asya Bibi were pardoned, quote, there will be terrible consequences against the government and the judiciary. The second party besides the TLP is the Milli Muslim League, or MML, which is the political front of the lashkar e taiba which everybody is familiar with as the banned terrorist group thought to be responsible for the 2008 Mumbai attacks. Despite the claims that the two parties are unrelated, images of Hafiz Saeed, who's the leader of the LET, were all over the election campaigns um, and posters of the MML. And then finally, the last few years has also seen the growing, um, or the continued, and I would argue, the growing relevance of the anti-Shia party, the Ahle Sunnah Wal Jamaat, ASWJ, which is linked to the militant Lashkar Jang VLEJ. So there's an official ban on this party um, because of its anti-Shia status and violence, but nonetheless, the ASWJ contested the elections under a different name, Rayak. So in many ways, I do think that the emergence of these parties does indeed signify a qualitative shift and change in the type of Islamist political party that is coming forward to contest elections. And I think that many local observers would agree. So for example, Pakistan's leading English language newspaper, Dawn, wrote at the time, and again I quote, there is a clear difference between religio-political parties that engage with the processes of parliamentary democracy and those that hold it in contempt and will ultimately undermine it. But how exactly should we think about this difference? So many of us will know, for example, that even the long-standing mainstream political parties, the jamaat e islami and the JUI that I mentioned earlier, they've had militant proxies um, and they've had alliances with various militant actors, whether it's the JS overlapping membership with members of the Hezbollah Mujahideen in Kashmir, or whether it's um, their violent student wing, the IJT, or again, of course, linkages that we're all familiar with between JUI's various factions and the Afghan Taliban. However, I think there are still important dis distinctions that we should consider. So these newer hardline parties either overtly or directly threaten the state um, with violence and target the state, directly threaten and kill minorities within Pakistan in a way that the JI and the JUI do not participate in today. And then the other, uh, um, the other engagement is in violent campaigns outside of Pakistan's borders, directly, again, rather than through militant proxies or armed proxies. So I think it would be more accurate to say that the newer parties, the MML, TLP, um, ASWJ, which is not new, a kind of a reincarnation of earlier SSP, nonetheless think of them as armed proxies or armed groups with political wings or violent political movements rather than as political parties per se. So why am I belaboring this point? Why is this distinction important? Well, first it's important from a theoretical perspective. We don't want to be painting all parties that have some linkages to religion or Islam with the same brush. And so it's important to think about um, the ways in which using just a, a broad term like Islamist or religious party can obscure important diversity, some of which I've already outlined. And second, and this gets to the second question that I posed, when we think about whether the inclusion of Islamist parties in the political or democratic process can moderate their goals, the answer depends on what type of Islamist political party we're talking about and knowing how and why they engage in violence um, is really key and critical to answering this question. So this hypothesis is known as the inclusion moderation hypothesis, and scholars have suggested that if we bring Islamist parties into the political mainstream, they will moderate their tactics, and in many cases their ideology, and will then put down arms. So we have seen this in Indonesia, for example, and more recently in Tunisia as well. However, I suggest that while this theory is likely to fit certain Islamist parties and in certain electoral conditions, it is much less likely to be the case for the hardline parties that I've outlined in Pakistan's current electoral system. And there are many reasons for this. So first, the Pakistani electoral system is one in which violence is routinely employed. 
is one of a range of what Paul Stanilin refers to as electoral irregularities that both secular and non-secular parties alike utilize. So in this context, determining if a party is moderate just by whether or not it's employed or engaged in violence is hardly a good measure. Second, the parties have found that they can use violence, or indeed just the threat of violence, to push their policy agenda from outside of the legislative system. So this is the case um, with the TLP and the blasphemy issue, for example, which makes their presence in the legislative bodies much less significant. And then finally, and this brings me to my last question, such parties don't ultimately have an incentive to put down arms because of the support that they receive both from mainstream parties and the other powers that be in our society. So keen followers of Pakistani politics will recall seeing numerous pictures on social media prior to the 2018 elections, but also prior to the 2013 elections in which members of mainstream parties were seated alongside members of militant groups, in particular the ASWJ. So they were seating with them, seated with them at um, rallies that the ASWJ was holding or engaged in seat adjustments with them, et cetera. And this was the case for even the left-leaning Pakistan People's Party, the right of center Pakistan Muslims League Nawaz, PMLN, et cetera. But much evidence exists to show that at the local level, electoral alliances of convenience have taken place between mainstream parties and some of these hardline parties. So this leads us to you know, a natural question, why? On the one hand, it does point to the fact that the ASWJ does contain and control vital vote banks in the society. And then we should pause again and ask, why? What is the source of this support? Does it indicate that people in Pakistan have almost overnight started advocating for violence against Shias or other minorities? So what my research shows, um, and I've been doing research um, on topics related to political violence for about the last six years, um, my research shows that what the ASWJ and other militant, other hardline Islamist parties are doing is basically filling gaps which have been left by mainstream political parties, as well as the breakdown of traditional power structures in society. So I'll give you one example to illustrate my point before I end. So mainstream parties, again, whether it's the PPP, the PMLN, or the PTI, they lack comprehensive organizational presence at the local level. And this means that in order to win votes, particularly in the more rural areas of society, they have to rely on pre-existing or traditional patron elites. Historically, these traditional elites have been feudals, landed elites, or the heads of kinship networks known as biradaries. Without their support, the parties have been effectively um, unable to secure a victory. And so they needed to bring on these individuals in order to maintain linkages with voters, orchestrate clientelistic exchange, et cetera. But what we're seeing now is that the influence of these traditional patrons in the form of landed elites and heads of baradri, et cetera, are starting to dwindle. And this is particularly the case in urbanizing areas of the country. So here, um, you know, greater economic opportunities have severed links between um, individuals and former, their former patron elites in the forms of feudals, et cetera, and the increasing salience of the Islamic identity, and that's a separate topic which relates to funding from other countries and proxy wars and 1979 onwards, et cetera, but the increasing salience of Islamic identity that we see in Pakistan is also starting to challenge the role of traditional um, kinship networks and biradri identities and tribal identities, et cetera. And so this gap is being filled by sectarian clerics, many of whom are affiliated with groups like the ASWJ. And so they've started to gain local influence as they provide an alternative to these older structures of power. As such, they have become the new electoral intermediary, which the mainstream parties can turn to when they need blocks of votes in certain parts of the country. So voters turn to them for support. They certainly do. I'm not discounting the fact that they would have ideological reasons for support, but I, I think that it's much more important to see them as the new patron elite, the people that are solving their local level problems, whether it's access to Thanagachari, whether it's providing them jobs, et cetera. But these are the individuals who are solving the material needs of the, um, of the individuals in, in much of, at least rural Pakistan. So to sum up, um, the advent of these hardline parties does, I argue, indicate a shift in the type of Islamist party contesting elections. And while, again, not all of these parties have seen success at the polls, most of them have not, um, some are nonetheless working to carve out a space for themselves in the political sphere and in the political mainstream. Second, their inclusion in the political process 
is unlikely to moderate either their tactics or their ideology. And then finally, while the presence of these parties does, doesn't suggest necessarily that the populace of Pakistan is radicalizing overnight or um, becoming increasingly intolerant necessarily, it does suggest that there are important structural factors at play that which if left unimpeded and if the space is continued to be provided to these actors, then the danger that the Pakistani populace does continue down the path of increasing radicalization and intolerance is likely. Well, thank you very much, Jamila Fosadiga. A really terrific uh, contribution right there. I mean, this is a, a recent development, this issue of new religious parties trying to contest elections and join the mainstream, and I think it's something that has to be included in a conversation with radicalization issues. So uh, we're going to go right to the questions. I'm not going to pose any, um, but I'm just going to th throw a question out there for the three of you to consider um, as we go to the questions. And that's, I think, the logical follow-up question. We, you know, mo mo those of us in the room, we, we know, generally speaking, what, what types of factors cause extremism. We know why it, why it happens. And for sure, this is not a conversation that we should only be talking about in the Pakistan context. For sure, this is something that occurs in so many other parts of the world. So we know the main problem, we know the causes, and we've heard in many cases the same correctives. You know, we've heard about this, the necessity of educational uh, curricular reforms, criminal justice reforms, but in many cases there hasn't been much progress. So the question is, moving forward, and you don't need to answer it now, but just keep it in mind, and maybe you'd want to weigh in during the discussion, how do you change that? How do you develop the right type of inse incentive structure? Uh, it's a very tough question, but it's a logical question. How do you muster the political will to deal with these types, to actually implement these proposed reforms that have been thrown around for, s for so long? And uh, to be fair, it's not just a question that comes up with the issue of tackling extremism, but you know, things like expanding the tax base and, and so on. So I'll let you all consider that, um, but we'll, let's, let's go into the questions now. So we'll take, if it's okay with, with all of you, we'll take a few at once, and then we'll come back to the panel. Uh, okay, so we'll start on this side of the room. <coughs> we'll start all the way in the back, the gentleman all the way in the back, the blonde hair. Yeah, so m my question is, we saw that TLP... Oh, sorry, if you could identify yourself oh, as well. Oh, I'm we sorry. Don't know who you my are. name's uh, Adam Weinstein. And uh, my question um, is that we've, we saw TLP's Darna was able to make the law minister resign, and they've threatened follow-on Jalsas, which was mentioned in the panel. And um, Mr. Gould pointed out that religious parties historically don't get a large percentage of the vote, but I guess my question is, is it even, uh, do, do these new re religious parties even have an interest in receiving the vote? Or is, is their power really in being able to act as spoilers in elections and dictating from the square? And I guess a, a follow-on question to that would be, you know, we, in, in the last election we saw PTI figures and PMLN figures meeting with uh, ASWJ figures and there were photos of that that were circulated online. And a as you pointed out, uh, Dr. Siddiqui pointed out that the big parties lack organizational capability um, on the ground. They lack grassroots capability. And how much of that has been a result of the big parties uh, sort of um, removing themselves from localized politics and very local politics uh, taking a back seat? Um, is that a fair assessment? Is that one of the causes, I, I guess, is what I'm asking? Okay, thanks. We'll take a, two, a few more on this side, then we'll go to the other side of the room for the next round. So, yeah, uh, Bill, uh, right to, to your left. Uh, yes, right there. Yep. Hello, my name is uh, Fatma Go, and uh, I represent Sindhi American community. Um, as an executive director of Sindhi American PAC, um, I advocate um, human rights for Sindhi people. And there has been a lot of enforced uh, disappearances, forced conversions, and I have noticed that these um, extremists um, and these very radical Islamic groups, they have, uh, you know, kind of very well penetrated, especially into the villages of Sindh, and they have a lot of powers over there. And I want to, like, my concern is if, you know, Sindhis, they go missing, you know, thousands of Sindhis, they go missing, um, enforced disappearances are happening on a daily basis. And these extremists, they have so much of free way. They can go and they can do whatever they, they want. And if uh, a teacher or a doctor, they stand up for their community or for their rights, 
they go missing in that country. So I want to know the role of you know agencies and the and the army uh, with that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And the final question for on this side for now, the woman right here, the third row. I think it's a red and blue sweater. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Liliana Rodriguez. I'm a national defense expert from Argentina and national defense former student here in Washington, D.C. My question is, uh, it is well known that uh, recruitment, terrorist recruitment is, is happens in Pakistan, especially by the, by the border of Afghanistan and India. So my question is, how this recruitment happens? Due to financial motivation, due to parental advisors, or just revenge? Thanks. Let's stop there. So a question about like, essentially looking at the relationship between mainstream political parties and the religious hardliners. It's a very different type of question about Cindy's, uh, and then a question about uh, terrorist recruitment. So anyone want to start? Oh, go ahead. Um, <coughs> should we start with your question? You were... Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think the traditional ruling elites, the political elites, uh, have been reluctant in uh, taking the bull by the horn. For the, I think the status quo suits them, and uh, attacking the status quo, I think, is the most difficult job. Nobody wants to jeopardize their political constituency, mm -hmm. uh, electoral constituency, and that's why they just uh, try to coexist with all those. And as for the meetings uh, of the big parties, big leaders with the smaller, with the religious parties, uh, you know, I have a different view on that. What do you do with these people? Do you ostracize them, just consign them to a co into a corner, put them in jail, push them into the Arabian Sea, or just try to engage them somehow, keep them on board through your social political contacts? Uh, it's, it's just a quandary, you know, when we he come here in the West, uh, in Europe here, it's just always this big fuss uh, being made about even the mainstreaming. But what do you do? Uh, do you bomb them out, all of them? You know, what's the, what's the fault of these thousands, tens of thousands of children who are studying in these religious seminaries which are associated, linked with the, with the mosques of, of the various sects? The problem is that, that the neither the military nor the political elites have a plan, have a, uh, have a plausible, actionable plan to mainstream, logically uh, mainstream these parties. The only way to neutralize them is to provide alternative good services, how to in create an in incentive structure at the state level so that people don't feel uh, uh, tempted to join uh, these groups. Um, these, on the Sindhi question, uh, I think we don't need to take it very seriously because the formulation of it itself is like when thousands of Sindhis go missing, and this is ludicrous, I would say. Uh, sorry to use this word, but uh, there is a commission working on the dis enforced disappearances. Yes, this is an issue. Uh, worth consideration and a, a cause of concern for everybody. Any illegal act by any state agency must be taken, must be held accountable, must be taken to the court. But now to say that sitting here uh, and you, to tell the people that thousands of Sindhis go missing, sorry, I haven't heard. A few, yes, may go missing. Uh, this is a country where a lot of things are happening, right? Uh, so please, I... Yeah. Please, 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 please. Uh, look, I said any, I said any illegal act should be taken to task, should be taken to the court. Did I say this? I'm not condoning, right? Whether it's Balochistan. What is human rights? It's you and me. You know, <laughs> sorry. Look, you know, I've been a practicing journalist for 30 years. I know how this works how Reporters, Reporters Sans Frontier works. Uh, all I'm trying to say, I'm not denying people are not getting, dis, uh, uh, getting disappeared, you know, but let's, you know, I wanted to give my response. I'm not here to debate. All I said, if it's a, a, any action, any disappearance, 
has to be dealt with legally. This is illegal if somebody goes missing. That's what I wanted to say. And as for the proliferation of madaris or these religious groups in Sin, I think you better ask the Pakistan people's. Okay. You know, ask, I think, the Pakistan People's Party has been ruling, ruling this, uh, this province for more than 20 years, you know. Did either of you want to respond? I, yeah. Uh, you want to go? Uh, go ahead. Okay. I just uh, wanted to quickly uh, respond to um, the idea of this recruitment business. So, you know, I mean, <clears throat> the thing is that if we look at different uh, uh, points raised by the panelists and, and also some of the questions, so it's a bit hydra-headed. There is uh, some, in some measure, some of the recruitment that takes place has some economic drivers on on the um, in some other cases it has ideological drivers in some other cases it is linked to the void left by mainstream political parties on the ground as Nailofer uh, highlighted so it is a combination of several factors so there is no single explanation f uh, w which can uh, uh, answer your question about recruitment there's no single motivation at work i mean it's it's a and it also depends from region to region so why are there new seminaries coming up in sindh uh, uh, why why is a sectarian militia operating in in, in baluchistan uh, why um, are uh, uh, different kinds of militias operating in punjab so these are these are linked to geopolitical domestic politics issues and the and the reality is that we haven't been paying attention uh, adequate attention to to it and that's why it has grown it has become more and more complicated and uh, and and hence the the complexity uh, of of dealing with it um yeah just take a couple of minutes to respond to the first question so i think your question was um do basically do parties like the TLP even want votes? Do they want to win elections? And I think that's a really good question. I think we don't have, well, I think in a lot of ways we're still figuring out this TLP phenomenon because it's, you know, why, who voted for them? I think the dynamics are different in urban centers like Karachi and elsewhere. Uh, again, not a very sizable number of votes, but maybe one that could improve, increase in the future, et cetera. Um, but I, I'm thinking about this a lot as I'm thinking about the precise distinction between parties like the GI and JUI and parties like the TLP, et cetera. Um, I think that I think you're onto something that I don't think, at least the way I see it, is much less about being within parliament and much more about kind of spreading their ideology. And they can do so through protests and so on. And this is why we saw, I think a lot of people were surprised that even though they had done maybe better than they had even expected in the elections, just because they're a brand new party, that even despite that, they went straight to the streets right after. Just a few weeks later, they were out on the streets again. And there's just a small point on the links between groups like the ASWJ and the mainstream parties. I think my um, ultimate point with that is it's I'm kind of almost moving away from the question about whether this has to do with mainstreaming, which I think is maybe a default. But what I'm, at least from my perspective and my research, it seems to suggest that the ASWJ phenomenon is much more about local level considerations and traditional structures of power and how that's changing than it is about the factors that fit into this global narrative of Islam and so on. And so not to say that that's not part of their mandate. It's 100% like anti-Shia party. That is definitely its mandate. It's made it very explicit and very clear. But at the local level, why do parties ally with them because of the votes? Why do they have the votes? Partly because of the ideology and partly because other structures in society have failed. And so I don't even think necessarily that we have to talk about mainstreaming all the time or radicalization. We can just talk about like w well, the other ways in which we can deal with the problems of people at the local level. Um, and so we can move it away a little bit from this general discourse that we yeah. have. Uh, okay, let's take some questions on this side. We'll start with Karam Hussein over there. So uh, yeah, there we go. Come down here. Just a quick uh, question slash comment on the. Okay, this is I'm, I'm Khuram. I'm one of the actual panelists from the previous discussion. I'm a Karachi-based journalist, and um, I remember in the in the uh, 2018 election just now, um, our reporters who went out to cover the TLP candidates uh, during the campaigning, when they came back, they told us that uh, all of the people staffing the TLP offices are actually MQM. Right, and uh, these were MQM people who, because of the crackdown on the MQM, had been pushed out of the party, and many of them in uh, constituencies like Moripur and um, um, 
Well, the, the guy I spoke to was actually had just come back from Moripur, but also in the civil lines area and um, in um, um, Malir and Landhi. Uh, that's what they saw. And they said even in some of the MQM offices, there may be an MQM f poster outside, but when you went inside the office, the office walls were plastered with TLP posters. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the same people who were previously mobilizing votes for uh, Altaf Hussain are now mobilizing votes for, for Rizvi. Yeah. Um, and uh, their main opposition, when, when, when our people spoke to them, was not even the state, uh, it was nobody other than the ASWJ, actually. So the competition was between these two. And in Moripur, the guy that they had chosen was told, uh, was actually famous for somebody who was a street fighter in um, uh, the capture of mosques, strategic mosques. So there were mosques in these highly populated, densely populated urban areas, like in Sadar, that are worth a lot of money and uh, where a great deal of money is collected in donations and having control of that mosque is uh, a, a big money spinner for whichever party has it. So, you know, a, a lot of the competition that was taking place at the grassroots level in these parties actually had more to do with the party's street cred than it did with the, with the message and with the ideology mm -hmm. and everything. And it reminded me uh, significantly of 1992 when something similar happened, those MQM people who were pushed out because of Operation Blue Fox at that time, the military operation against the MQM, many of those individuals sh surfaced with the Sunni Tariq suddenly. So you saw them a few weeks later, and they had long beards, and how they grew beards that fast, you know, it was uh, <laughs> uh, uh, was impressive. But but you know, they were wearing green turbans, and they had beards, mm -hmm. and suddenly they were they, they'd become Sunni Tariq people, and many of them were killed off subsequently by the MQM. Some of them came back, but as the operation proceeded, so you know, many of the rank and file of the urban. Uh, religious phenomenon that you're talking about is actually also being fed by this and they're not in the game for the message the message is entirely irrelevant to these right. people they're okay. in the game for the street cred and what it means for being able to control your street corner specifically at least that's what we saw in the 2018 election and that's what we saw in 1992 as well okay thank you interesting question i'm going to come down here right to the front right in the front row yep all right the mic's right behind you thank you assalamu alaikum my name is Faizan Haq. I represent APPAC. Um, we are very happy to co-sponsor this event. I think this was a very good congratulations, Amber. Let's have a big hand for Amber. Mm -hmm. a great job. Uh, Professor Siddiqui, very, very impressive analysis. Thank you so much for being so prepared. Um, I wanted to, um, since I attended only today's um, uh, sessions, so one thing which I wanted to bring to everybody's attention which is very important is that in whose language the narrative is being explained. Because increasingly, in post 9-11, many states, when they shifted, be before that they were uh, a bit of a public-centric states, but they became security-centric states, including the United States of America. So there was a narrative that was imported, and that narrative has never been challenged. And we constantly are looking through those lenses which are not indigenous to that nation or those people. So uh, I couldn't help that uh, since morning I have not heard any reference of any kind to any um, indigenous um, sources of inspiration or language or, for example, you know, when I was uh, listening, so uh, a, a small line from Adam Iqbal is that Obe khabar chhod viday Nakle Sadai Digara. I and then you know it says that uh, that oh you who are not aware that let go echoing the voice or the sounds of the other because it is the other. So we intellectuals, uh, especially people who have been studying things from Western perspective, they travel to the West mentally look at themselves and then come back and then explain. And in this travel of language and space and culture, what they lose is the connection with their own people. Thank you. Thanks. And Athar, you had wanted to say something before, right? OK. Uh, just wait for the mic. Uh, right in the front row. No, no, right in front of you. <coughs> oh, OK. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for uh, passing uh, it on. <laughs> <laughs> Michael. Yeah, my question for the panel is, do you see 
state and religion separating in Pakistan anytime soon? And if not, what can be done separating. to cultivate this awareness uh, in the people of Pakistan? Okay, let's go with those questions. So we had Quram's very interesting question about the politics and the MQM as possible and the involvement and all that. Uh, we had this very interesting comment about uh, the issue of language, and then we had this question about state and religion separations. And weighty queries. Does mm -hmm. anyone want to respond first? Well, I think if it's take catching up with the 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 strongest, the, the largest democracy, the United States, how can we separate state and religion and uh, in Pakistan, a country like Pakistan, which is so divided and uh, so porous also in governance. So uh, this is uh, so unfortunate. You know, I had uh, drawn a lot of inspiration from Turkey back in 2010, where, you know, there's a very clear separation <coughs> of the state business uh, from the religion. Uh, and it's institutionally done. Uh, and and uh, we tried, you know, to just emulate or propose to our people, our uh, legislators, yeah, but uh, unfortunately, nobody has uh, listened to that, and um, the pro pro there's no no hope for this in the immediate uh, future. I would say. Okay, I uh, I want to begin with Michael. I wanted to actually respond to your question about the slow change, and I'll just link it to these observations. I think uh, change and reform is slow, painful, and evolutionary, and I think uh, things have changed in the recent decade or so. So take the case of the 18th Amendment. It has restructured Pakistan's governance. There are people who oppose it. There are people who strongly favor it. And I think uh, the what 18th Amendment has done is in the, in the context of the two key issues that uh, were highlighted, uh, uh, education and curricula, have uh, been devolved uh, to the provinces. I mean, as lock, stock, and barrel. Uh, the experiences have been mixed, of course, with education. We've seen better spending and uh, some uh, progress as well in, in Khabir Pakhtunkhwa, in Punjab, both. And uh, <clears throat> with respect to curricula, the, uh, it's been one step forward, two steps backward, but, you know, it's an ongoing thing. So we have seen improvements in curricula uh, that is being taught in Sindh, uh, Sindh schools. We have seen some minor improvements in curricula in the Punjab. In KP, the previous, uh, the, uh, you know, ANP government launched a series of changes. Some of them got reversed, but then other changes were made. So it's an ongoing kind of political and ideological negotiation that has come in the wake of a structural reform. And for the 18th Amendment and such other uh, measures, it, uh, you know, a, a decade or eight years is too s small a time period to assess change. I think on the uh, issue of justice sector, also there have been changes. So look at the case of Khabir Pakhtunkhwa police. Of course, I mean, I don't uh, fully uh, agree with the, with the extraordinary hype uh, that the PTI does about it, but there have been changes. People do say that the uh, police in KP uh, uh, take less bribes. People have greater confidence, so this was also manifested in the election uh, results of 2018, where uh, voters said that they were voting for PTI because it has brought cha changes, right? So we are seeing this, and then look at the uh, you know lawyers' movement. It's, it's been a decade. Uh, judges, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, becoming more autonomous and more. I mean, judiciary at the moment is very controversial. Jabbar Sab very rightly lay, laid out the problem, but you know, it is no longer the subservient judiciary of the past. Mm. Okay, so when people say, "Oh, well, you know, this uh, this court or this judge is completely uh, being manipulated," it's 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 inaccurate because it's a it's an institutional uh, change that is going to take time, it is going to be painful, it is going to be re re uh, resisted, and most importantly, the local government uh, uh, thing. And, and that is what link, links to Khurram's uh, point to some degree, that you know, until we don't establish and strengthen local democracy, grassroots political organization, uh, bring state closer to people, and have a, a certain kind of a citizen uh, state compact at that level, we are going to create these voids and these uh, and and these um, open contests for other forces to manipulate, whether it's a religious extremists or or gangs, uh, urban gangs, etc. So I think um, a, um, you know, 
I do see that there is change uh, taking place. I think we 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 must not become very cynical or or uh, you know negative or or pessimistic because uh, you know this is not going to be a quick process you know only revolutionary change or radical change is is is, is overnight or whatever but uh, in in institutional evolution i mean the fact of the matter is that today in pakistan uh, our uh, minister for human rights has spoken very clearly about enforced disappearances i want to go uh, to that to the question earlier raised so you know for a minister to speak up and attend a rally and say that she's going to do something about it means a lot. Earlier, this issue was not even discussed. You know, it was not even part of the, of the mainstream public conversation. It has entered. So I, I guess it's going to be a step-by-step -step change for that. What we do need is a is an active civil society, a free media, and well-organized political parties, mainstream political parties that can work in tandem. I mean, that's where we have problems at the moment because we we have a civil society and media uh, somewhat under uh, some uh, pressure and control. And I think that needs to go for the future uh, evolution of both the democratic project as well as the institutional change that I referred to in my earlier part of my remarks. Mm. Yeah, just to quickly echo Reza's points, I agree entirely. And um, thanks, Khurram, for your really valuable insight. I'd be love to talk to you more offline about these issues. Um, but yeah, I think what you said does kind of um, reiterate my point about like the lack of main or the absence of mainstream parties. And I think as I'm criticizing the parties, and I think every institution in Pakistan warrants criticism, I think it's important to nonetheless realize that you know the parties have faced an uphill battle in Pakistan over its history and. You know the question about local organization arose, and you know, local body party-based local body elections didn't exist. You know, it's a there's a long history in which partisan affiliation was slow to develop, and there's reasons for this, etc. So it's not as if the party political parties have just failed out of nowhere. There's reasons and ways in which we can be optimistic for them to develop in the future. But it does seem like um, you know maybe if the MQM hadn't if had had continued. In, as it had in previous elections, maybe the TLP phenomenon that we saw in Karachi would have been very different, right? And that seems like a likely scenario, it's especially um, with what Khurram just told us as well. And so, you know, there's something to be said about this idea of like strengthening the democratic institutions that do exist. And once they, I think, are strengthened, because, you know, I've done a lot of surveys in Fox and voter surveys trying to unpack voter why voters vote the way they do. And we talk a lot about anti-Indian opinion and we talk a lot about ideology and religion. And voters in Pakistan, as in voters in most developing countries, vote because of people who can satisfy their basic needs, right? That's just how it works in most of these countries and the survey shows exactly that. And so I think we kind of need to just like move away from these narratives a little bit. Not to say they're not important at all. I am actually you know, a strong believer in like we can't just dismiss them just because extremism happens in other countries doesn't mean that minorities in Pakistan don't have a really hard time in a lot of cases and so these are important but that the solutions might actually be more mundane right they might be about just strengthening local democratic institutions well unfortunately we're going to have to start wrapping up and transition to our into our uh, closing uh, session um, but we could thank our three panelists as well as our spotlight speaker uh, for a really terrific uh, discussion really terrific. Thank you very much. Let me just say w a few brief things uh, before we um, uh, before we close uh, formally. We've, we, it's, it's been a, it's been an interesting two days. Uh, we've covered a wide variety of uh, complex issues, both domestic and international. And uh, you know, I think while we've had some very rich discussions, I sometimes feel like there was so much more that could have been said. Uh, we could have taken any one of the six sessions that we've had over the last few days and built an entire conference around it. Um, and we have engaged in what's been the overarching question animating this um, policy symposium, and that is how can Pakistan capitalize on its opportunities and address its challenges? It's a deceptively simple question that isn't really thought through as much as it should be, particularly on a comprehensive level. Uh, we've assembled a tremendously impressive group of speakers, um, most of whom, not many, most of whom have traveled from Pakistan. Uh, we had a number of people here who have rarely, if ever, offered their comments in public forums. 
uh, in Washington. So the breadth of the brain power was really tremendous. Uh, we heard from some more established and known voices as well as some new and fresh voices, which I think is important. Um, and most importantly, people were listening. Uh, you know, I've been impressed to see you know, a uh, fairly full room and at times a full room for two days. Um, and that's, that's, that's something to, to, to really uh, be happy about, particularly when we weren't always talking about security-related matters. Um, so I think the bottom line, you know, we may not have answered comprehensively or completely all the questions that we set out to answer, but we couldn't have expected that. But I think it's just important that we've had these conversations. Uh, people are listening. People are contributing uh, to these conversations. So that's important. So um, just like to reiterate a few thanks, and then we're going to have a very brief, very brief uh, ceremony here. Uh, let's wanted to reiterate some thanks that uh, both uh, myself and Indus have mentioned earlier. First, my colleagues at the Wilson Center for all of their tremendous and tireless work over the last two days. Uh, not many of them are in the room right now, but also our interns, Abdullah Wasti over there. Thank you for his assistance. And uh, Narima, who may have been in here. Um, also want to thank uh, my wonderful partners, our wonderful partners uh, and, and friends at, uh, at Indus. Um, thank you. I <laughs> also want to uh, thank some of our other, other supporters, the American-Pakistan Public Affairs Committee. Thank you. <laughs> and also the uh, Houston uh, Karachi Sister City, Asso City Association. Thank you. Um, and most of all, thank you for all of you for attending, and particularly those of you, there have been some of you I know who have been here for every session over the two days, so you really deserve a gold star. Thank you. Um, and finally, uh, we want to end with a very brief ceremony. Uh, we wanted to uh, recognize a very important individual, and that is Athar Javed, the president of, of Indus, who has really been instrumental in what we've been doing over the last few days. Um, we want to recognize and honor uh, his passion and his guidance that led to the founding of Indus and his continued leadership as its president, his deep commitment, the democratic values, um, continue to shape the Indus mission, I know, and as a member of the Indus academic panel, I've witnessed Indus um, establish a pace and a, a tone for, uh, for U.S.-Pakistan dialogue, um, which I think has been demonstrated in this, in this uh, symposium. So I wanted to invite uh, not only Athar, but also uh, Shahzad um, to come up with a memento of our appreciation um, to pass on to him. So please come on up. Yeah. Oh. Hey, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well done.